I have with us today um, two distinguished panelists who will help us with that case study. And uh, before I introduce them, let me also say that we'll go directly from this session on, on Brazil, we'll go directly into the final and concluding session where we have some wrap-up. Uh, both of these sessions are more abbreviated than the previous <coughs> sessions in case people are wondering about their time. Although if you look at the program itself, you'll notice that the case study of, in, on Brazil actually extends until 4 a.m. <laughs> so, uh, if you didn't bring your sleeping bag, we might have a break so that you can go get it. But, but uh, we will go straight from the Brazil presentation into our final concluding session, which is, is a, a briefer wrap-up session. Well, it's my privilege to recognize for the wrap-up our distinguished colleague and the director of the International Center for Law and Religion Studies, uh, Professor Cole Durham, who is uh, my colleague and my employer. <laughs> I've got to say nice things about him, right? I, actually, I could go on and on about nice things about him. The, the incredible work, truly miraculous work that he's done internationally in the field of religious freedom. As a center, we've been very focused on international religious freedom and with some some uh, success, quite a bit of success really and, and some success locally. We've participated in, in religious freedom issues on a national U.S. level. But it's been Cole's genius and entrepreneurial spirit and his tremendous qualities both as a distinguished scholar in the field, really one of the field makers, someone who's made this field be a legitimate field of study in the world, it's been his tremendous qualities, uh, not only as a scholar, but also his entrepreneurial skills and his ambassadorial skills that have made such a huge impact in this particular field. I think you go across the world and, and uh, there is not anyone in this field who doesn't know Cole personally or has heard of him and admired him. Uh, he, currently, the president of the International Consortium for Law and Religion Studies, which is a large international organization. And it's, it's an incredible privilege for me to be able to associate with him. Cole will take the wrap-up session. Okay, we'll do the other session first. We'll do the other session first, yes. <laughs> uh, you're, you're anxious to wrap up now? No. no. <laughs> okay. Uh, and the, for the Brazil session, I'm pleased to introduce um, Greg Clark, who is, is uh, employed by the Office of General Counsel for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He's most recently been assigned in Brazil as the area legal counsel for the church. He is, I think, in terms of the, his term of service as an area legal counsel, of those currently serving, has served longer than anyone. I think it's up to 11 years. Uh, he was, before working for the church, worked as a lawyer for Occidental Petroleum and for Exxon in, in the Middle East and in Ecuador. Uh, he is a former Marine officer and, and, uh, and is the father of, of six children, a uh, wonderful family as well. And to his left is uh, Ricardo Lecce, who is a, a distinguished Brazilian citizen, member of the church, a stake president in Brazil, who has been very involved in, religious, in, in the sort of grassroots religious freedom efforts that the church has been involved with in Brazil. We're grateful to have him as well. Greg will make the presentation, and, and um, Brother Lechi will, will be part of the panel discussion. Thank you. Well, it is an honor to be here, and I'm particularly thrilled to see the reduced numbers that are here for. That means there are less crazy questions that I might have to entertain at the end. Um, I'm actually uh, 
thrilled for the opportunity. I've just left Brazil. I've been transferred to the Dominican Republic, so I've just ended my assignment in Brazil, and my greatest challenge in the DR was to keep the sand out of my iPad. But, um, but let me talk to you about Brazil and the, the, the historic sort of developments that have been occurring over the last couple of years in Brazil on the religious freedom front. When I arrived in, in Brazil, the question is, what am I supposed to do as an area legal counsel and as, as a member of Bill Atkins' 10K group, which is a special group that was put together to try to identify at least 10,000 people who might be influential and, and moving forward uh, religious freedom issues in the event the church would need to call on them. And Bill gave me the assignment to try to find out how we might be able to engage the business community um, in some way. And as I was studying that issue of how do, I, how do we engage the business community in religious freedom initiatives, I have to confess, I had no idea what I was supposed to do. And Bill has long confessed he didn't either. Uh, but he did give me the business community segment of our 10K group. And, and as I was kind of like Nephi, not knowing where I was, what I was supposed to do, but as, a, as I prayerfully pondered and, and worked on that issue, I was reading an Australian Human Rights Commission report of 2008 where it talked about that the, the responsibilities of businesses doing business in Australia, they needed not only to, to obey and comply with the laws of Australia and international norms, but there are certain things that they needed to do as far as their corporate social responsibility as, as a business, as a cor good corporate citizen. It talked about promoting certain human rights, and, and they listed, that commission report listed a bundle of human rights, and in the middle of that, that bundle was religious freedom. And when I read that, it was as if someone turned on the light switch. And th there was the genesis of the idea that we need to try to recruit the business community as an ally in promoting religious freedom. Um, and and their, their rationale for wanting to do it would be that it's part of their corporate social responsibility. But I thought that's pretty a lame justification for the average person in business, they're more focused on the bottom line. And so it wasn't until Robert Snyder introduced me to an article written by uh, Dr. Brian Grimm where he provided that missing link, that the business community might be interested in engaging in religious freedom um, if they understood it was good for their bottom line. And so Robert Snyder and I and, and others collaborated, but mostly Robert Snyder, uh, collaborated on a, on a white paper. Uh, and in that white paper, we talked about the war on how religious freedom is being lost. And I'm going to talk to you about that war that is being lost and this need for this new ally. And, and in that white paper, we discussed the, the CSR, or Corporate Social Responsibility of Companies, to promote the human right of religious freedom. And we discussed in there the Brian Grimm analysis and logic that religious freedom is good for business, and that would be the anchor. That would be why the business community would be willing to be that new ally. Um, once again, I give all credit to Robert Snyder for really pulling the uh, laboring oar in the drafting and the revision of that white paper. Um, what's interesting is Cole Durham had invited uh, Dr. Brian Grimm, who was uh, working with Pew. Your thing is not on the screen. Really? But it will be in a second. Um, do we have some tech people here that know how to project? It's, it looks really good on my screen. Um, <laughs> I thought we just had to press the blank thing and it would be okay. There we go. Okay. Um, what was interesting is that Cole Durham invited Brian to attend one of his um, famous symposiums a couple of years back, and it was at that symposium that I felt impressed to approach Dr. Grimm to tell him that we were working on this white paper and that we were using his research, his analysis, as, as kind of the anchor as to why this would interest the business community. And I asked him, would you be willing to read our white paper? He said, yeah, when you get it finished, send it to me. A year later, to uh, Robert's credit, we were able to finish this thing and get it to Brian Grimm, and he came back with a full-throated endorsement of the, of, the, of the rationale in the white paper. And he even asked, he even asked, what plans do you have for launching this initiative? Brian later would tell me that 
upon reading this, this white paper, the seeds of conversion were sown with him, that he needed to do something in, a, in an effort to promote this message that was in the white paper about recruiting the business community as a new ally. So, but I'd like to diver, uh, digress for just a second to try to convince you that the, the war on religious freedom is being lost and even more reason for the counsel of our senior brethren for all of us to become engaged. We're not supposed to become engaged just because it's a good thing. It's that the war on religious freedom is being lost and unless we engage, uh, it's at greater risk. For example, 43%, this is from the Pew, uh, foundation. 43% of current countries have high governmental restrictions with regard to religion. But that's not where the, the, the bad news is. The bad news is that 76% of the people of the world live in those countries. In other words, 5.3 billion people live with high governmental res uh, restrictions against religion. Now, what's the evidence that the war is being lost? I mean, those are bad numbers. <clears throat> it's the increase in the number of countries with, uh, with high government restrictions just in the last, from 2007 to 2012, increased by almost 50%. Now, so it was mentioned that I served as an officer in the Marine Corps. I was a very junior officer in the Marine Corps. But still, had my commanding officer, if he were to ask me, how goes the war on religion? I would say we're losing it when you have over the past five years an increase in losses, casualties of 50%. Okay, so all the good things that are be do being done by those that are currently engaged in the fight for religious freedom are commendable, but they're not winning the war. And so that's, what, that's why there's this emphasis on the need to recruit a new ally in, in, this, in this fight. Now, to the issue, how is religious freedom good for business? I'm going to talk about it on a macro level, on a, a, a societal level, and then on a micro level, and, and very broad brush. And there are studies, not just by Brian Grimm and others, but also by, the, by a study from Harvard and a study from the Boston University that supports some of these findings, that religious freedom in general helps to reduce war and, and violence, religious freedom. It helps to reduce corruption, improve community environments, enhance goodwill and public image. Where religious communities are so actively engaged in humanitarian efforts. At a micro level, uh, it, it improves uh, uh, if a person can, can live in a country and, and work in an environment where they can honor and, and, and have their, their religion respected or where they can practice a religion, that helps on recruitment and retention. I lived in the Middle East for seven years and I can tell you firsthand experiences, what, and I was a branch president, and so I know what my members were telling me, and I know what I observed with others who were, who were not of my faith. It matters when you live in a country where there is no religious freedom. And, and many expats would either ref, refuse assignments in some of those Middle Eastern countries, or they would cut short their assignments. So uh, the ability to practice one's religion w among one's family uh, can have an impact on recruitment and retention, and it can have an impact on morale. If things are miserable at home because the family can't practice their religion or, or freely exercise their religion, that impacts their morale, and an unhappy wife makes for a miserable expat. Um, it also impacts the workplace environment where, where there is discrimination in the workplace. As a matter of fact, number four, uh, fewer employee claims of religious discrimination. When Elder Wickman sent me to South Africa for five weeks to kind of hold down the fort, uh, pending some uh, new assignments of ALCs and ALCs in South Africa, I learned that a, a good portion, a high percentage of the labor claims that were clogging up the labor courts in South Africa had a religious discrimination component to them. And so where, where you have uh, uh, religious tolerance or, or freedom in a country, it can also uh, impact the bottom line and not having to waste time, money, and resources on religious discrimination claims. I borrowed this slide from one of Brian Grimm's presentations where he highlights that uh, the World Economic Forum's pillars of economic competitiveness and GMP are stronger in countries where, they're, where religious freedom is respected. Um, I'd like to now show you a, a film, uh, a video, um, where a, a particular company 
wanted to, sh to, to show that they could make a difference as a company. They could make a difference in bridging intercultural uh, uh, differences between two companies who have literally been at war with each other, India and Pakistan. And how that would be not only good to make a difference socially, but to make a difference economically in, in their ability to sell their product on both sides of the border. And so I'd like to show you this film. The relationship between India and Pakistan. Oh, I'm sorry. The relationship between India and Pakistan is one that has seen a lot of lows. It's stressful, it's tense, it seems it's not improving and it's getting worse. It's only been 60 years that we have been apart. Before that we were living harmoniously together. I think all the strife would go away if you took away the barbed in the middle of the two countries. It saddens me that we have this neighbor that we can't even go visit. They have this perception which they put in the in the head that that's the bad guy. But when they actually meet him, they realize, you know what, he's just like me. Mainly because there's no communication. They're near us, but we have no access to them. And it's sad because together I think we would do wonders. where young people can exchange ideas, thoughts, gestures and take away that communication gap that exists. If I have any opportunity to go to India, I'll surely go there. The whole idea of actually touching hands, it's like communicating with each other without words and that action speaks louder than anything else. This is what we are supposed to do, right? We are going to take minor steps so that we are going to solve bigger issues. It is more about, you know, how similar we are as opposed to how different we are. Togetherness. Humanity, this is what we want, more and more exchange. How cool is that? And the purpose of that is just to show that companies can make a difference. Okay, companies can make a difference. I, rem I admit that I got a little uh, misty-eyed when the first time I saw it. I thought that was so, so touching especially considering two nations that had virtually fought wars. Um, so what was the next step? I knew I had this, this product, this white paper, thanks to Robert Snyder. I recruited the, the area public affairs folks. I shared that white paper with um, one of the people in the public affairs department who sat on uh, a, a commission for religious freedom at the state level. And he arranged a speaking opportunity. So I presented this white paper, the concept about the need to recruit the business community and how the business community can make a difference in promoting religious freedom. And the, the Religious Freedom Commission of the Sao Paulo Bar Association fell in love with that new concept. They saw that as a new ally for their push for religious freedom. And as a result of that, a lot of speaking engagements um, uh, were arranged. And some of the members that were, that were on that Religious Freedom Commission of this, the, the, the uh, Bar Association of Sao Paulo were of other faiths. Seventh-day Adventist. And so 
all of a sudden I, I, I was getting invited to participate in Seventh-day Adventist uh, religious freedom events. And in particular, in, in May of 2013, they invited me to participate in a series of events with them. And I thought, instead of quoting Brian Grimm in my studies, why don't I invite Brian Grimm to come? And, and to my uh, excitement, he accepted. And I thought that if this is important enough to have Brian come, it's important enough to have Cole there. And so Cole also came. And uh, he, Carl the Lecce, actually arranged the very first of the meetings that we had there with the, in the Covey uh, fa uh, facility. Um, it was during the, these, this, these May 2013 trips that Brian and I started to strategize about his exit strategy from the Pew Foundation. He had become converted that this is, was a, a thrilling idea of trying to recruit the business community as a new ally. Matter of fact, when Brian was visiting some of his NGOs and giving talks uh, with, on behalf of Pew and sharing this idea of recruiting the business community, he was getting feedback from some of them that this was the most exciting idea that they've heard in, 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 in advancing religious freedom, that the most exciting idea they had heard in decades. And so that even excited Brian even more to, to, to want to take the leap from Pew and become an advocate. And so in 2014, it started. Uh, Brian ended his relationship with Pew in, in late Jan at the end of January. Kurt McConkey, as I tell this Brazil story, this is a story of volunteers. And, and, and this will show how all of us can do something. Kurt McConkey, on a pro bono basis, formed his foundation. Um, and, and, and in February, uh, days later, Brian came to Brazil to launch the initiative in Brazil. And the core message that we had, oh, I, sh I guess I should say, Brian asked that I, that I serve as a vice president of this foundation. I asked Bill Atkin if he would object if I, in addition to my role as area legal counsel, if I could serve as a volunteer in, in the foundation, and Bill approved it. And so the core message that we had in, for our, our partners, future partners in Brazil was that Brazil is the number one leader in religious freedom. Um, what do I mean by that? Of the 25 most populous countries in the world, Brazil has the least amount of government restrictions against religion. Uh, it made it n number one in the world. And second, because of this number one world ranking, our message to our partners in Brazil was Brazil needed to take a leadership role in promoting religious freedom in the world. Um, we have heard time and time again from, uh, in quotes from the senior brother, and here's another one, about the importance of working with others, forming coalitions in this fight for religious freedom. Elder Oaks states here, we must also stand shoulder to shoulder with other believers to preserve and strengthen the freedom to advocate and practice our religious beliefs, whatever they are. So in the spirit of following that council of, of building coalitions, that's exactly what we tried to do in Brazil. Um, and here are the members of the coalition that we formed in Brazil. The church, Brian's Religious Freedom Business Association, and it's a Brazilian affiliate. It, Ricardo Lecce formed a Brazilian association uh, directly affiliated with Brian's foundation. Um, the, the two bar associations in Sao Paulo and in the Distrito Federal were also members of our coalition. We work closely with the Seventh-day Adventists. And, and the Catholic Church. Ana Jury is the legal organization for the evangelical community promoting religious freedom. We've established relationships and rapport with them. And we recruited prominent business people. Carlos Wizard Marchines, probably one of the few LDS billionaires in the church, uh, Brazilian, and he became a close ally of ours, as well as other prominent business people such as Francisco Valin, who I'll talk about in a second. And then most recently, the Muslim community. Let me just show you some pictures. Here's a picture of us recruiting the area president of the church and, and presenting to him uh, the message and the need. He thought that was a clever idea to, to recruit the business community. We, we, uh, here's some pictures of us in our meetings with the different bar associations. The bar associations in, in Brazil are quite different than the bar association in the United States. It's actually a, a quasi-governmental organization that has more stature then I would suggest that the U.S. Bar Associations have. Here's a picture of us with our, our friends, the Seventh-day Adventists. It's interesting because of our relationship with the Seventh-day Adventists, when Elder Anderson of the Twelve came and on short notice wanted to, uh, when, when we were looking for opportunities for him to speak, because of the relationship we had built with them, we were able to slip 
an apostle into a speaking schedule in a major conference that the Seventh-day Adventists held in Brasilia. They invited all of their leadership from South America to come to a, a particular forum and we were able to have Elder Anderson, an apostle, speak to them about the importance of religious freedom. Uh, we also, here's some pictures of us meeting with the two different cardinals in Brazil, one in Sao Paulo and one, one in Rio de Janeiro, where they verbally endorsed this concept of recruiting the business community to become a new ally. Here's some pictures of us meeting with a famous LDS judge um, and with Carlos Marchines and talking to him about this initiative. And this other picture here, you see us meeting with, with a very prominent Brazilian businessman who said to us, I'm convinced, I'm converted, give me something. Give me corporate documents that I can use that will, whether it's an HR policy, mission statements, or guidelines on how we can promote religious freedom in my business. Based on that request, that request inspired a project that I gave to Robert Snyder and I asked his assistance of developing those corporate documents. Robert worked with the Gavin Parker and Rob Ellis, the son of Elder Ellis, in developing those. They in turn reached out to attorneys, HR professionals, and we now have those corporate documents that we'll be rolling out in Brazil on a pilot basis and which have been delivered to the United Nations Global Compact for their consideration on a global basis. Here's a picture of our meeting with Vice President Temer, the Vice President of Brazil, where we explained to him that Brazil was number one. He was shocked. He had no idea that his country was, was number one in anything. It clearly wasn't number one in the World Cup. And so he, this was a new opportunity for them to be number one in something. And so that was an exciting message. Um, and you ask, got to ask yourself the question. Uh, by the way, you can see these are all volunteers. These are people who've, who've dedicated the time. This is Ramona Hamor, a member of the church, ex-federal uh, congresswoman, same party as the vice president. She set up the meeting. And the other people are also volunteers with us that donated their time to meet with the vice president. But what was the result of that? Was that just a cool meeting with no consequence? Like this is a cool meeting, and the question is, will it have any consequence? What happened in that meeting with Vice President Temer? He committed to us in that meeting and he followed through that he was going to publish an, an article that would have national dist, uh, uh, distribution in Brazil talking about the importance of religious freedom and how Brazil was number one and needed to take a leadership role. But that's not all he did. He got on a plane with Hamona Hamor and traveled to a city, met with three, 30 other religious leaders and talked about Brazil's ranking as number one and how Brazil needed to step up and become a world leader in promoting religious freedom. Here's a picture of uh, Hicarla who's sitting on the stand who formed that, that foundation, the affiliated foundation with Brian. This is one of the most prominent business people, tele, a TV star in, in Brazil and Carlos Wizard Martins, the billionaire, LDS billionaire. And we made the presentation for him and we're going to try to tap into his business organization and recruiting the business community. Here's uh, a picture of Brian Grimm presenting to um, Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, a document that was co-published by the foundation, talking about how the business community, illustrating four examples of how the business community can make a difference in promoting intercultural faith and understanding. Um, and, and one of our volunteers in our foundation translated that document into Portuguese and we gave it back to the United Nations Global Compact for their, for their use on a global basis. I suspect one of the, the hallmarks of uh, things that have happened that are kind of exciting was when I received a letter from Elder Perry inviting us, and I give credit to Bill Ackenor to Rob, uh, Robert Snyder for having coordinated that, um, but a Elder Perry asked that Brian and I make a presentation to the Quorum of the Twelve there were seven presidents and the presiding bishopric, and that group is called the Area Committee. And we were asked to present to them how the business community can more effectively promote religious freedom and tell us about these initiatives in Brazil. And, during the, and so we did. And, and during that presentation, one of the members of the 12 asked me, well, um, Greg and Brian, are you receiving any resistance from the business community on this message that they need to become engaged in and becoming allies and promoting religious freedom. And my response to that member of the 12 and to the 12 and, and the other brethren was, the first question out of the mouth of any LDS business person is, where are the senior brethren on this initiative? And Elder Perry, with his booming voice said, 
you can tell them that the senior brethren are very enthusiastic about this initiative. So if any of you have that question, where are the senior brethren on this initiative of recruiting the business community as a new ally, you have Elder Perry's response. They are very enthusiastic about this initiative. Um, sometime after that opportunity, um, I, my legal coordinator came to me and said, Greg, we're going to be selling a property, one of the church's excess properties, to the Muslim community. Um, would you like to attend the future clo the closing on that to see if we can invite them to become members of this coalition of, of churches to promote religious freedom? And I thought, how cool. How cool would that be? And thank goodness to the inspiration of my legal coordinator to even ask that question. And so I went to that meeting. And I felt, and I waited to ask the question at a point in the transaction where I didn't think I'd queer the deal in case they, did, they weren't interested. But I asked the question, would you like to join with us and other organizations and other churches in promoting religious freedom in Brazil? And I was thrilled when they said, of course, we would love to join that initiative. Come to our mosque and let's talk more about it. So this is a picture of us at their mosque talking more about that. And while we were at their mosque talking about what this coalition had done thus far and what we hope to do, uh, I felt impressed to ask them, would you be willing to, to, to host in your mosque a religious freedom celebration? Because how symbolic would that be if we could have Christians, Jews, Muslims, Afro-religionists, uh, and others all together in your mosque celebrating religious freedom, especially given what's going on in the world in the Middle East? with the slaughters that are happening there with the jihadists. And they said, of course. Matter of fact, this will be our opportunity to show the world that not all Muslims are, are extremists, are not jihadists. And so the planning went on for that event over a number of months. And what was the result of that planning? Many of you have already read about it in the church news. It was a historic event. We had six general authorities attend that event. The entire area presidency, uh, Bishop Cosse, President Clayton of the, of the Seven Presidents, and Elder Christofferson. And Elder Christofferson was the keynote speaker at that event. Here in this picture, you're gonna, you'll see that we have representatives from the Jewish community, the Seventh-day Adventists, the, business, the Muslim businessmen who helped organized the whole event with his people. Congressman Moroni Torgan, uh, who is uh, LDS, and others, and Elder Christofferson. Incredible historic event. But what makes this even more interesting or more historical is what happened after the event. Following the event, our Muslim friends, very thrilled about this religious freedom event they had hosted in their mosque, publicized that event to Muslims in 40 other countries. They, our Muslim friends, want to continue with us and continue to participate with us in all of our religious freedom activities that we plan. And this was the first, uh, first annual event and they're looking forward to us planning this next annual event. I anticipate that they're gonna continue to publicize their participation in their events to their buddies in 40 other Muslim countries. How cool is that? We've got Muslims talking about religious freedom to Muslims. I think that's strategic. I shared that, uh, that view with Elder Christofferson, with the OGC and with the area presidency. This is, this is strategic. We now have Brazilian Muslims who can be a key to promoting religious freedom in the Muslim world. Most recently, Ricardo participated with Brian Grimm, signed a letter of intent with the, uh, with the United Nations Global Compact and the Business for Peace to promote a business and interfaith peace awards event that will coincide with the Olympics, starting with the upcoming Olympics in Rio. And the purpose of this awards event is to, it will honor, publicize, and highlight business leaders who have demonstrated significant advances and innovations in interfaith understanding and peace in the workplace and community, thereby fostering increased interreligious and intercultural understanding, freedom of religion, belief, and peace. What's really cool, we now have a relationship with the United Nations Global Compact, and, um, and that will give us incredible reach, not only in Brazil, but in other countries where we want to replicate uh, these sort of initiatives. I'll go quickly through the sort of things that we, what's our time? I know we started late, but what's our time? 
we're supposed to finish it for so you've got that five minutes. Okay. We've got a lot of things that we're going to continue to do in Brazil, and um, we're going to continue with uh, the first two things I've already talked about. We have projects of law that we have Congressman Moroni Torgan advancing um, that are supported by the Bar Association and other churches. We're going to be hosting events to educate and promote the corporate documents that Robert Snyder led the initiative. This is where the rubber meets the road. You know how having events like this where we meet and talk about this stuff it really is only of significance, in my opinion, if something happens, if something concrete, if this is just to get together and, and, and preach to the choir, then that's of little use, in my opinion. But if something concrete comes out of it, then that's, that's significant. Where someone decides to act as a result of one of these type of meetings, that's significant. I think it's also significant that we're going to be putting it, we're going to design a program, a, a distribution plan, an education program in Brazil where we can take these corporate documents and get them into the hands of the business community. That's where the rubber meets the road, not in a, not in a session like this, where you get those sort of documents in a company where people's lives are being affected because the company changed the way they're doing business to honor respect and, and, and provide for religious accommodation. Um, here are resources that are available to, to folks that are interested in, in promoting similar sort of initiatives, which you can't see because I'm blowing through them too quickly. But here are just some suggestions that I'll go through real quickly. Uh, if you're an area legal counsel, um, you can focus on recruiting your area presidency and your, your public affair folks. You can build coalitions with other churches and organizations to foster religious faith. This is stuff. Everybody, I've heard the question asked in every session, what can I do? Or presentations on what can I do? Here are just my humble suggestions on things that can actually be done based on our modest experience in Brazil. You can recruit local bar associations or other religious freedom organizations to speak in their events. You can recruit prominent business people interested in engaging in religious freedom initiatives. And if you've got some business people that are interested in promoting religious freedom initiatives, they can talk to me. They, or they can talk to Brian Grimm, I'll refer them to Brian Grimm, to see how we can recruit you and let you join with our, our initiatives. You can engage with key government officials who are tasked or are interested in safeguarding religious liberty. Once again, you can involve Brian Grimm and his foundation. Brian will go anywhere. Brian loves to talk on this stuff, and, he, and his connection now with the United Nations Global Compact is not insignificant. You can create, don't wait for the events to happen, create your own events religious freedom events similar to what we did in the Muslim mosque. And look for opportunities to devote, develop, promote, and empower local talent, like uh, Hakkar, though. Arrange for religious freedom programs and seminars for local trade organizations, including AmCham. Promote and educate and distribute the corporate documents prepared by Robert Snyder and his team. If any of you are interested in getting your hands on these corporate documents, talk to me, talk to Robert. You can go to the Foundation's website. They're posted there. There are concrete documents that can be used in the business community. And then develop project law that fosters some aspect of religious freedom. I love the doctrinal reason why we're promoting religious freedom. That, the brethren have always said it's the doctrine that motivates. It's not the programs, it's the doctrine. Well, here's some doctrine. As we walk the path of spiritual liberty in these day, last days, we must understand that the faithful use of our agency depends on our having religious freedom. We already know that Satan does not want this freedom to be ours. He attempted to destroy moral agency in heaven, and now on earth he is fiercely undermining, opposing, and spreading confusion about religious freedom, what it is, and why it is essential to our spiritual life and our very salvation. <coughs> Elder Cook, my, elder, my plea today is that all religions join together to defend faith and religious freedom in a matter that protects people of diverse faiths as well as those of no faith. We must not only protect our ability to profess our own religion, but also protect the right of each religion to minister its own doctrines and laws. Here's the mantra that we use, whether in my, the Office of General Counsel, in my office, or with uh, the foundation, and I've proposed to Brian, this should be our mantra. Think big, work hard, exercise faith, and follow his promptings. And it's my personal witness that as we do this, as we think big, as we work hard, as we exercise faith, he will open doors, doors that we can't even begin to imagine. I can tell you, three years ago, I never would have imagined that I'd be given a presentation at the Quorum of the Twelve. 
I never would have imagined we'd be meeting with a vice president. I never would have imagined we'd have a letter of intent with the United Nations Global Compact. M my personal experience is, is, that, is that our Heavenly Father is engaged in this effort to promote religious freedom. He's looking for more hands on deck. And that as we work, as we think big, work hard, exercise faith, and follow his promptings, he will open doors faster than we can walk through them. But we need to act. And I'm thankful for this opportunity to share this message. Uh, and I do it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.